A strange world where particles appear and disappear in a billionth of a second. Where electrons communicate even when they are far away from each other. Where they can be in more than one place. What is this quantum physics? No one knows enough about what it is or what it does for us. As you can imagine, we must be physicists to understand this subject thoroughly. But even if we are not physicists, can't we follow our curiosity? So let's take a look at what quantum mechanics is and where it is used from the perspective of an ordinary person. Beneath the realities that we know or think we know in our daily lives lies a very different world that challenges our minds and destroys all the experiences we have ever had. For hundreds or even thousands of years, we have been trying to figure out how the universe works. As you all know, Sir Isaac Newton, the father of classical physics, which is known as a milestone in this regard, carried out very important studies. He explained to us how our world, objects, planets, and the solar system work, and even today, he remains at the top of the list of the most influential scientists in history. Newton's book, the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, published in 1687, is one of the most important books in history. It formed the basis of classical mechanics. With this work, Newton established the law of universal gravitation and the three laws of motion, which dominated the world of science for the next three centuries. Newton's classical mechanics is so helpful today that we see its effects in many things created by human beings. If any object's initial velocity, location, and forces on any object are known, we can know how this object will move using Newtonian mechanics. So much so that when we hit a golf ball, we can predict how high it will rise, with what acceleration, and when it will fall to the ground. We also have precise and predictable information on many subjects, such as how an airplane can fly and how much a pulley can help us lift a load. What about the laws of quantum mechanics? Why do they exist? Were the laws of classical physics not enough for us? Is that why we needed another concept called quantum physics? In fact, until recently, scientists thought that the smallest building block of matter was the atom. In other words, according to them, everything in the universe could only consist of atoms at the most basic level. However, in 1897, Joseph John Thomson argued that this was wrong. He announced that he had discovered a particle in the subatomic world called the electron, which is 1,000 times smaller than the atom. Thus, the journey to the subatomic world began. This journey to the subatomic world seemed to rewrite the laws of physics. However, in the early years of the discoveries, scientists drew a very different atomic model from the one that modern science shows us today. They thought of electrons as moving homogeneously within the atom without an orbit, and, as a complement to that, as positively charged particles. There were even those who said that electrons constituted the vast majority of the mass of the atom. It all started with scientists who wanted to solve the mystery of light. For example, light coming out of a glass tube filled with gas. When scientists observed this light through a prism, they saw something they had never seen before. The light was not in blurred colors like in a rainbow, but in very sharp, distinct, fine lines. How this continued was a mystery. Many scientists, including Max Planck, Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, and Erwin Schrödinger, tried to solve the secret of the mysterious color lines in the early 20th century. The quantum world is so strange that electrons behave differently from the laws of classical mechanics discovered by Isaac Newton, much different from the planets orbiting our solar system or golf balls. From the classical physics point of view, if a particle is here, you know that it will soon be here when you apply a force to it. However, this is not the case in quantum mechanics. When we ask a particle where it will be in quantum mechanics, it cannot answer us with certainty that it will soon be there. However, it can allow us to make a prediction. 20% probability that I will be somewhere around here. 
One of the most astonishing concepts for solving the mystery came from physicist Niels Bohr. Bohr believed that the solution to the mystery lay at the heart of matter in the structure of the atom. He said that when the atom was heated, electrons could be excited and jump from one fixed orbit to another. This leap was as if teleporting without traveling a distance in space. Each jump could emit energy in the form of light at very distinct frequencies. And this was the reason why atoms produced very distinct colors. This is where the concept of quantum jump came from, and this was only the beginning. Albert Einstein was not afraid of new ideas. In the 1920s, however, quantum mechanics began to move in a direction that deviated from the precise, perfect predictions that were the hallmark of classical physics. Einstein was very disturbed by this. But this was the quantum world, and in order to understand it, we had to discard all the thoughts that made sense in our macro world, which we had experienced for years. Now, I will take you to an experiment to understand the mind-boggling world of quantum mechanics. This experiment was first carried out in more primitive ways by Thomas Young in 1803. But the scientists of the 20th century wanted to do this experiment with a subatomic particle, the electron, to unravel the secrets of this mysterious world. Here is the famous double-slit experiment with Dr. Quantum. And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double-slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now, let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, two bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter, through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought, maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So. They decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself. 
to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. So how is it that things change when observation comes into play? How do these electrons know they're being observed? It's like they're tiny, mindful beings. Niels Bohr thought that measurement changed everything. He thought that before measuring or observing the molecule, its properties were uncertain. Before the detector could locate the electron, the electron could be everywhere in very different positions. They called this superposition. But when the measurement occurred, they seemed to force the electron to choose one of these different possibilities. Niels Bohr accepted that reality is inherently uncertain, but Einstein did not. He could not believe that chance was the basis of reality and said, God does not play dice. Niels Bohr responded to this, God knows what to do, stop telling him what to do. In 1935, Einstein thought he had found the weak point of quantum mechanics. It was a very strange thing that went against the whole logical picture of the universe. He thought this would prove that the theory was incomplete. According to the theory he developed, an event at one point in the universe, no matter at what distance, would instantly affect another. He called it spooky action at a distance. Because he thought this kind of event was absurd. This would mean communication faster than the speed of light in the universe, which contradicted the theory of relativity. But today, we can do this experiment, and what we have found is really frightening. This theory, which Einstein opposed, is now called quantum entanglement. I would like to explain this entanglement debate between Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr as follows. Suppose we have two coins in our hands. Think of them as two electrons, and imagine that we make them interact with each other. Now, we separate the two electrons. We leave one on Earth and send the other one to the Moon. According to Niels Bohr, when we put a detector on the electron on Earth and measure it, we simultaneously affect its other partner on the Moon. So, to put it simply, if I measure that the coin on Earth rotates clockwise, its partner on the Moon rotates anti-clockwise, or vice versa. If it starts spinning anti-clockwise on Earth, its partner on the Moon starts spinning clockwise. But the electrons make this choice as soon as you measure one of them. According to Einstein, this event was complete nonsense. He did not think it was possible for particles to connect at such a distance. Moreover, even if there was a connection between them, it could not happen faster than the speed of light. Einstein wanted to look at the event from a different perspective. So, now, think of electrons as pairs of gloves. And after making the gloves interact with each other, we put one in a box and the other in another box. Then we send one of them to the moon again. Now, when we open the box on Earth, if we see the right glove, we know immediately that the one on the moon is the left glove. But there's nothing mysterious about it. Everything is already determined before we take the measurement. 
I mean, before we open the box. So, who is right? Bohr's ghost coins, which can connect with each other in a strange way? Or Einstein's gloves, whose fate is already predetermined? When Einstein died in 1955, the answer to the question was still not found. However, the French physicist Alain Aspect put an end to this issue. Aspect's experiments proved Niels Bohr was right in an incredible way. Einstein had been wrong. Particles could communicate over long distances, interestingly, even at interstellar distances. More than a century of scientific research shows that the answer to the question of what matter is is both wave and particle. The macro universe that we can see that is us and our environment is mathematically and physically a special case of the micro universe. Since our material wavelength is tiny, we show negligible wave properties. In fact, we all exhibit particle properties. The strangeness of the quantum world reveals how different the universe's workings are from what we have known so far. However, quantum mechanics lies at the basis of the world that constitutes all reality. There is no such thing as classical mechanics. Quantum mechanics underlies the entire mechanical universe that actually works. This world of possibilities of quantum mechanics, its entangled particles, and its definition of matter as both wave and particle are the clearest indicators that we will encounter very different realities in the future and that we will uncover a new secret of the universe we know and think we know every day.